My name is Jamie Gertz, and I played Muffy Tepperman on Square Pegs. Oh, wow. It was interesting. I had just gotten my driver's license. So I remember um, driving for the first time. My parents were out of town, and so I didn't really have their permission to uh, leave school. But I, I, I took <laughs> the initiative of my own and got a girlfriend of mine to do the same, even though she wasn't auditioning. And we took the car and we drove downtown and there were lots of kids there. I remember a lot of young um, kids there and it was at the Ritz Carlton Hotel, I think in Chicago. And I went in and read in the morning and they kind of told me to go have lunch and come back after lunch. And I came back after lunch and I read again. And that was kind of it. They said, thank you very much. And maybe a couple, few days later, they called my house and said they wanted to fly me out to um, Los Angeles for network approval. Now, my parents had no idea that this audition went on or that I had gone for this. So when I called them in Florida and I said to them, I need to, uh, one of you has to come home because I need to go for network approval. And my parents are like, what does that mean? We had absolutely no clue what that meant, no clue what it, what it you know, entailed. And my mother said, what, who are these people? You know? And so I remember Eve Branstein, who was the casting director, talked to my parents and they realized it was legitimate. And um, my dad flew home. And it was the first time that a stretch limousine had ever come on our street. They had sent a stretch limousine. So I'm like, network approval must be great because you get, and I remember my dad and I flew first class and I remember they gave us food that you didn't have to pay for. So it was all these things for me uh, in, in just leaving Chicago for the first time and going to California and we, they put us up at the, um, I remember this vividly, they put us up at the Holiday Inn in Hollywood and there was um, some kind of bust that went on at the table next to us in the cafeteria, in the restaurant at the hotel. My father was still getting ready and I went down to have a muffin and uh, they arrested someone at the table next to me. <laughs> so I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be an interesting ride. And then I went in for um, network approval, which was a, such a daunting experience for a young person. But, but youth was on my side in that I didn't really know what it meant. And so there were just a bunch of men basically sitting in chairs and suits. And you went in and read. And then you came back out. And you went and read again. And I remember Al Burton came out and uh, Uncle Al came out and he told me that I got the job right then and there. So it was really amazing, very exciting. Changed my life. It changed my life in that I don't think I ever would have um, had the courage to pursue acting professionally. Um, I, I certainly would have, I never would have come out to Los Angeles on my own um, without having gone to college, maybe studying something else. I think my path maybe would have veered from, from theater and acting to maybe law or something else because I definitely, you know, was studying in school and going to go to college and that was going to be, you know, and whether I acted or didn't act, it professionally wasn't really um, something that we thought that I'd make a living at it. But, but Square Pegs definitely put me on a path of, of my passion. I found my voice. I found everything. And that's all due to Square Pegs. Well, we did the pilot when I was a junior in high school. So we did the pilot and then we waited to see if it got picked up, which I didn't, any of this lingo, I didn't even know what picked up meant. I just would tell people, well, we're waiting to see if we're going to be picked up. Like, I, like someone was coming to the door to take me for dinner. I lived at the Oakwood Garden Apartments, which I hear now have like, you, you, I watch some of, you know, behind the scenes, behind the music, and you see that they have all these training acting camps and um, vocal coaches and, and drama coaches at the Oakwood Garden Apartments now. But when we were there, it was pretty um, bare bones, minimum, not real pretty. If I had to do it over again, I probably would have picked something closer to Norwalk. I mean, our, our trip getting to, to set every day, we were filming at a high school in Norwalk, was immense driving those freeways and we had to be, you know, we had to go to school part of the day, we had to um, work the other part of the day, so it was a lot of figuring it out. But the Oakwood Garden Apartments were interesting. I remember a man with a nipple ring tried to pick my mother up at the pool.
I also remember, I remember that our call times were different and Merritt, who played um, Johnny Slash, frequently overslept. He was living there too. He was living there also. And we would often get a call, can you go over to Merritt's apartment and wake him up? And one time we were called and they said, can you go get him, you know, uh, uh, and bring him to set? And so my mom got in the car, we went over, I knocked on the door, and I and he came to the door buck naked. And I was you know, 17, and I'm like, hi, Mary, you missed your call, and we're waiting downstairs, my mom's waiting, we'll take you. So, you know, and he's like, all right, I'll be right there. And, you know, so it was just crazy coming from where I came from, this just very Midwestern, you know, kind of, middle class, lovely, beautiful life to this kind of crazy, artistic, um, wonderful circus. And uh, so we, we often, Sarah lived there, John Femia lived there, Merritt lived there, and I lived there. One of my most vivid memories was when Bill Murray came to play um, a substitute teacher. And because I was from Chicago, he called me Chicago. Hey, Chicago. And he had rented um, a Mercedes-Benz convertible. And during lunch, I was telling him that I had just learned how to drive. I had just gotten my driver's license. He's like, oh, yeah? I said, yeah. So he threw me the Mercedes-Benz <laughs> keys, and he goes, let's go. Let's go for a ride. So I'm like, OK. And he's cleaning out the seats. And we get in, and we just start driving. And he's like, get on the freeway. Go on the freeway. I mean, I was like just driving this. Mercedes-Benz convertible. I don't know where my mother was or, you know, if she knew that I had, that he had absconded with me and they were looking for us. You know, lunch was clearly over and it was time to go back to work and no one knew where we were. And we kind of came back like 45 minutes late. And I, I think he got a talking to for that one, but it was just so brilliant that he just, you know, threw me the keys to this Mercedes-Benz and I was just, you know, driving around. And I just remember it was such a, a wonderful, um, place to be an actor in that, and a young actor, we were so enclosed. We weren't on a studio a lot. We were at this high school in Norwalk, California, so it was just us. And it was such a feeling of camaraderie. And we all ate together. I remember Sarah and I shared a, uh, the mobile homes. We each had our own little honey wagon, but we shared a honey wagon. We would just sit and, you know, want to keep talking and keep hanging. And so we would share a little tiny honey wagon and um, we had Father Guido Sarducci on the show. He was just so wonderful. We had, I remember from my bat mitzvah, there was an episode of Muffy Tepperman's bat mitzvah, which was interesting because they were in high school and she was a little old for bat mitzvah, but what the hell. And they had my real father play um, the rabbi and uh, he thought he had made it big then. That was his big break and Devo played at our, my bat mitzvah. And there was Devo, you know. I also remember um, that we postponed filming because John Belushi had died. And everyone was so sad about that. Now, I had not really known a lot about Saturday Night Live. I, I just, where I was coming from, I didn't watch a lot of it. And um, I remember everyone just being so sad. And I remember, you know, some filming post being postponed because I didn't realize that our whole writing staff was basically from Saturday Night Live and that, you know, but they were and this was their comrade and someone they had started out with. And I remember how sad everyone was when he passed. And um, But it was just so brilliantly written and such a great experience. I was closest to Sarah at the time. Yeah, we just, we, our apartments were basically right across from each other at the Oakwood Garden Apartments. And her mother is just such a lovely, lovely woman. I mean, I remember we'd, she was always making some kind of Chinese food concoction or, you know, and my mom was just putting pizza bread in the toaster and you could have a Hershey bar at my house, but not at her house. It was, they ate, you know, uh, she was kind of progressive. You know, we always had to listen to NPR on the radio. <laughs> You know, my mom made me listen, you know, I could listen to Billy Joel, I was listening to, you know, but when we got into uh, Sarah's mom's car, we, we'd have to listen to NPR and, um, you know, education was paramount in their family. Um, she was a teacher and um, I remember Aaron and Allegra, I learned a lot, Aaron and Allegra, Sarah's little 
siblings went to a Montessori school and I never even knew what Montessori, you know, how progressive was that? What's that like? And so um, we, were, we were really close back then. Um, I, re I remember filming the pilot and one of the v most vivid memories is we were near Disneyland. I remember I kept wanting to go to Disneyland and there was a horrific smell, a sulfur smell near where we were shooting and near this motel that we were staying at, which was, I mean, a dive motel. And here my mother's coming from a lovely house in the suburbs of Chicago, having to, you know, hang out at this motel in, in Norwalk. I don't know if we shot the pilot in Norwalk. We did. We did. And, um, and just a sulfur smell. There was some kind of soap factory or somewhere, something around there that smelled horrific. But um, I remember the song that, um, that Claudette sang. And um, I just remember being so excited. Do you want to sing the song? <laughs> I don't want to sing it right now. Do you want to say people please? <laughs> people please. Well, that was a big part of my audition, the people please. I had to, um, I remember Kim Friedman kept telling me to shoot out my chin when I was talking, you know just keep shooting and people please it behooves me and they loved me to say it behooves me that was a big big part of Muffy Tepperman's character you know trait and um, so you know I I have just I remember it was just so exciting filming that pilot I I ha always had a lot of energy and I always wanted to you know kind of I remember I had a nickname growing up Paula Perfect because my brothers would fight and I would say to my parents, you know, I had nothing to do with that. And my mother would say, yes, Paula, perfect. We know you're perfect. And, um, but I like to have a little more fun than Muffy. I'm not nearly as organized as Muffy was or, you know, ready to rally the troops. But I was, if, I, if the troops were being rallied, I was one to sing and dance and, you know, be a part of it. I was always the spirit, you know, person for our school. And I was a cheerleader in eighth grade. So, yeah, I mean, I think part of Muffy lived inside of me back then. Now I'm an old married woman. There's not much that left, but back then there was. And, I, and that always stuck with me, the fact that she was having fundraisers for a Guatemalan child and the things that she were, was fundraising for were the latest swimwear and cable television. <laughs> things that, that a poor little Guatemalan girl desperately does not need were what Muffy w w was raising money for and, you know, always concocting these crazy uh, schemes to help her Guatemalan child. I, I think it is amazing. I think it was ahead of its time. You know, I think CBS just didn't know what to do with us. I think it was a bunch of kind of young, wild writers that didn't fit the mold of what Hollywood was. I mean, they came from New York, they came from improv, they came from sketch comedy, and here they were going to be on prime time. They were going to write for teenagers. Was it appropriate? Wasn't it appropriate? And um, I think the network just didn't know what to do. And I think, you know, I'd like to think that if it had been today, we would have gotten a, you know, a much longer run. Um, but it's something to be proud of and something that started me, it gave me a life. It gave me my life, my professional life. It brought me out here where I met my, you know, husband. And so I always think fondly of Square Pegs and I am amazed by how many people remember it. I remember my little brother was five years younger than I and he came out for the summertime and um, so everyone in the office had him working. He would deliver messages for, you know, a dollar here, a dollar there. And I just remember him coming with the ratings. <laughs> and here he was, like, you know, nine, telling me about our ratings. Because he had heard in the office someone talking about the ratings and the fact that here's this little pisher, you know, running around talking about ratings. But it was all that stuff that was not in my vernacular that I now having done television for years and having realized how difficult it is to get something on the air, let alone sustain it and keep it there, is huge. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times networks are just so crazed if it's not an immediate hit and they just don't give it the time uh, that, that you need to find that audience. But we did, we had millions of people watching. Well, I'm always amazed when people say, you know, Muffy, and I'm like, oh my God, that was 25 years ago. I, I cannot believe that that's, 
you know, and I've done, I've done a few things since. So, you know, I'm kind of like, wow. But, um, but yeah, people are always so kind. I think it, it, it made a lot of people, what they were thinking in their heads and feeling in their hearts, if you didn't fit in, if you weren't quite the popular, hip, cool person, square pegs made, made it hip and cool to be smart, to be funny, to be different. Because the four main characters were smart, funny, and different. And so I think a lot of the kids who watched it, a lot of the teenagers went, you know what, they're cool. They may not be, it made the in, in crowd look so, you know, uh, pathetic and silly. And the nerdy crowd was just this smart, irreverent, funny, um, interesting group of people, the people you wanted to hang out with. When I heard that the show was canceled, I was devastated. I mean, I... I remember it was my senior year of high school and I did not want to fill out my college applications. And my mother was desperately trying to get me to fill out my college applications. And I'm like, Mom, I don't think you realize I'm on a major television show. <laughs> She's like, yeah, fill out your college applications. And Marge, who was the set teacher, was making me fill out my college applications. And um, I just thought this was going to go on forever. It was so much fun and so interesting and so cool and I thought it would go on forever and I remember just crying and crying when I heard that we, we didn't get picked up. I just could not believe it. And um, it was just a real, it was such a coming of age for me and then it was just like cut short so quickly. But thank God I filled out the college applications because I went to NYU and I you know studied for another year but I was kept on by um, embassy television to, to work on. They, they had given me a contract to kind of work on Facts of Life and different strokes. All the shows that they had at the time, um, I worked on a lot of those shows during my, yeah, during my freshman year of, of college. So that's really, you know, they, they were very kind to me. But then I, you know, I needed the money. I was, either you were going to study to learn to be an actor, or you were going to be an actor. And here I was getting opportunities to be an actor. And, um, and so there was, it was a no-brainer. And then I came back out here when I was 18. Mm -hmm. It was just such a lovely sense of family. No matter what was going on in your outside life, when you came to set, it all went away. No matter who had the crazy parents or who you know, had the crazy siblings or what was going on, when you got to set, it was just about creating. And it was just about having a good time. And um, I remember Tracy Nelson taking me. She was she had this Honda, I believe it was a Honda, and she could drive. I thought that you know she was so cool. And I remember she took me down Coldwater Canyon in her Honda, and um, and I was so nauseous from the the Coldwater Canyon, this very spirally you know uh, road here in California. And I just thought, God, if I could just be her, if I could just get a little bit of that and you know and Sarah's beautiful voice I remember Sarah would just sing and and out came this extraordinary voice and it's so interesting to me her success which has been so um, extraordinary and lovely is not so much based on her voice which was so beautiful I mean she was Annie on Broadway and I remember she sang in, in one of the episodes cafeteria line and I remember her I went with her when she went to record the song and I remember being brought to tears because it was so beautiful. And I couldn't believe such a beautiful voice was coming out of this little skinny, tiny person was this big, beautiful voice. And so it was just a magical time that I, I will be eternally grateful for.